Oh, I got up here. I had to sh make the video quite short because I did the long videos for talking about Boris Johnson and Nigel Farage. But we're going to put, uh, put it on part two now. So, uh, yeah. Anyway, I'm going to put the speaker here, as you can see. So I'm balanced. Right. Get into it. Here we go. Hopefully, the phone won't fall over. Let's try and position the dude. Again, fucking. So, guys, just get a bit annoyed with things. Everyone gets annoyed, but uh, yeah. More people voted to leave than voted for Satiq Khan as London Mayor. And Democrats like you and me voted in two Brexit Party MEPs recently. I'm here today to challenge that myth and to tell the world that we are London that I am London, and that Londoners believe in democracy. Sadiq Khan, pettered in the Smith. Settle down. Sadiq Khan, pettered in the Smith, is damaging to the fabric of our amazingly diverse, weird and wonderful city. A city that harbours people from every country in the world, from every outlook and every belief. A city which generates much of the wealth, not just for Europe, but also the rest of the world. He says that Brexit will stop us being an open and inclusive city. As an individual that ticks many diversity boxes myself living in London, I will not and cannot allow him to continue spreading these lies on my behalf. He does not speak for me. will not close us off from the rest of the world. It will in fact do the very opposite. A true and clean break Brexit will open us up to the rest of the world and not just the U European Union. We want people from Kenya, Thailand and Peru to become part of our multicultural city. London open and Brexit will make it open up further. And something very important to myself. I do now work as a mechanic, but before that, after facing mental health difficulties of my very own, I worked at a training initiative, one that supports those with mental health needs to rejoin the working world. And it's because of this I cannot help but feel like the cronies of Westminster refusing to enact what we voted for three years ago means serious injustices in our country are being ignored. I am determined to ensure that in our country, such as poor mental health provisions, to be rectified. So why did I want to become a PPC for the Brexit party? I decided to represent my damn self because they're not going to do it. And I hope to represent you too. Thank you. Bridget Tegan Lucas. Uh, a rising star, ladies and gentlemen, and that is why I truly believe that we're the Brexit Party, not only in the European elections, but also in the fourth thing general election, we have without question the highest quality candidates that ever stand for public office in living <laughs> Now, despite being a mere 25 weeks old, we have secured major political party status. And the good news is that means we're to something called a party political broadcast, which some of you may have seen. It's actually quite hard, as you can imagine, dealing with the BBC. Well, anyway, we secured it. It was shown last night, and hopefully you'll see it on the video now. Why hasn't Brexit? Will it happen at all? You might be bored of the B word, but Brexit is the big battle of our lives. <coughs> it's critical. It will decide our democracy. In 2016, the MP was elected on a promise to respect that referendum result. But keeps. That should worry us all.
What sort of democracy lets Parliament defy the people? Two Prime Ministers promised to deliver Brexit, but Theresa May's withdrawal agreement wasn't Brexit. It was the sort of surrender treaty you sign after losing a war. As Foreign Minister Boris Johnson said, May's deal would make us a slave state. Well, now Boris is PM, and his highest priority is to do a deal based on Mrs May's withdrawal agreement. Yes, Boris hopes to recycle the deal he labelled as slavery. He wants the European Union to change the Irish backstop, but even without it, the withdrawal agreement remains the worst deal in history. Boris's new deal will be Mrs May's betrayal with a new haircut. The withdrawal agreement means we pay the EU at least £39 billion. It's our money, better surely invested in our regions. It traps us inside the EU's customs union. We be free to make our own deals with the rest of the world. It lets European courts rule over everything from financial services to our fishing industry. What sovereign nation takes orders from a foreign court? We must make our own laws. It also signs us up to EU military policy. Who decides if Britain goes to war? We must have control of our own security. The Tory withdrawal agreement could be even worse than remaining. We'd be trapped under Brussels rules with no vote, no voice, no veto. Does that sound like the Brexit you voted for? No. Enough is enough. We need a clean break Brexit to make Britain a sovereign, independent nation with democratic control over laws, borders, money and defence. The Brexit party is ready for a clean break Brexit. If you're ready to break with the old politics, join us. You can see, you see clearly there, ladies and gentlemen, the horrors of the withdrawal agreement, the worst deal in history. It's appalling. Whereas we all know that with a clean break Brexit, it's a huge, huge opportunity for this country. It's what we call the Brexit plan, because Brexit is an optimistic, enthusiastic, ambitious word and we set out in June how we would produce that plan what we would do what we would invest in and by doing three simple things we create a fund of 200 billion pounds to invest here in this country the first thing the first thing is very simple we get rid of the absurd ludicrous HS2 scheme That's 100 billion. That's 100 billion, so we're going well. The next thing is, we're not going to send 39 billion to bungling bureaucrats in Brussels. And the third thing is, we're going to redirect 50% of the bloated, wasteful foreign aid budget back here where it's needed in our public services. To think that Westminster wants to send a hundred billion quid of our taxpayers' cash overseas, and when it's gone, it's gone forever. Do you want to do that? No. We do that. We in the Brexit Party. We do sit in the regions that have been left behind. We are invested country. Road and rail schemes. Invest in broadband. Invest in digital. Invest in free Wi-Fi across all public transport, not just the London Tube. We want to invest in young people, my word we do, in contrast to what we heard from the Labour Party this week. Good me, goodness me, they want to abolish it. They want to get rid of academies. They want to get rid of free schools. They want to get rid of successful independent schools. They want to steal the asset of charities, of schools. I wonder what they want to do with the money. Do they want to send it to their friends in Venezuela or their friends, their terrorist friends in the Middle East. So we will invest in education, and in particular, the current show with student loans. We very clearly said that instead of charging students over 6% on their student loans, we will have zero interest 
on student loans, because that is the right thing to do. We will also invest, we will also invest in a sim simple, workable apprentice scheme. This government has created a terrible thing called the Apprentice Levy, which is an absolute bureaucratic nightmare and it's led to a complete collapse in apprenticeships in this country. We'll sort that out and create a simple, workable scheme. So we'll invest in young people, we'll invest in the best businesses, we'll invest in entrepreneurs, because that creates growth and ambition and jobs that creates value for this country. We've got to keep investing, ladies and gentlemen. We'll also invest in smart taxation, not unfair, unpopular tax. We'll abolish the most hated, most unpopular tax in this country, inheritance tax. We'll just get rid of it. We will invest in other departments. We won't cut anything else except foreign aid budget. And most of all, gentlemen, we will invest in our freedom because that's what Brexit is all about. That is the ambition of the Brexit plan. And there is no one, there is no one who's fought harder for that freedom over the next five years more to secure our sovereignty than the next speaker. Richard Sleepy, through thick and thin, he has stuck by his beliefs because he knew that we could secure Brexit. Without Nigel, we could never end them. Without Nigel, there would have been no Brexit. And without Nigel, there would have been no Brexit party. And before we welcome him to the stage, and I have to tell you he's on cracking form, <laughs> let's just see him in action on the video. I fear that we are headed towards a big, big What we did in that six week campaign of the European elections is we managed to turn the hope and despair existed in this country into hope and optimism. The only party here, the Labour Party, we're the only party here who actually believes in Britain. This country now needs wholesale reform. We have to make sure that never joy in a democracy in this nation be so unwillingly betrayed by the Westminster political class. And all that Mrs May's deal is not a it's a new European treaty. I didn't like 25 years to leave European treaties to sign up to another one, Boris. And we will fight you to the end if you dare to do this. Whatever tricks they try to play, whatever deceptions, referendum, let the genie of the bottle. And we are going to win. Please welcome to stage, Nigel Farrar. <laughs> Okay, you know I'm shy. Come on, really. Good evening, London. Yeah. You know, it's a pretty remarkable time we're living through. Have you ever, in the space of the last couple of weeks, seen a parliament that is so widely and correctly held in contempt by the majority of the British people because of their behaviour? Now, I thought we'd turn this around because 25 weeks ago today when we launched the Brexit party and, I don't know, 25 weeks, we're not doing too badly really, are we? But I thought we'd achieved a remarkable thing. Not only did we reset the entire agenda in this country, not only 
did we help see Mrs. May on her way? Not only, not only, all right, I'll give you a chance. We did Mrs. May, all right? <laughs> and I very much doubt that Boris Johnson would have covered us if it hadn't been for what we've done. And we also, by campaigning and saying that the only practical way forward, the only way in reality we could leave on the 31st of October was with a clean break Brexit, we made that the most popular opinion in this country. But we did something else that in a civilised democracy was even more important. Think of the frustration, think of the anger as we headed towards March the 29th and realised, despite being told 108 times by the Prime Minister, despite being told everyone that we would leave, when we realised we weren't going to leave, there was a huge amount of anger in this country. And what we did in the Brexit Party, and what we can be incredibly proud of, I think, is we managed, we managed to turn that anger into hope and optimism. And that was an amazing achievement. Amazing achievement. And yet, that can happen. Four months on, we now have a parliament full of people who, despite every promise they made in the past, are doing their best to overturn the will of the British people, are breaking the promises they made to us at the general election. And I don't think it's too strong a word the other day that Boris Johnson was using the Nigel Farage plan. Imitation, imitation is quite a good form of flattery. But if somebody makes an express promise to you to vote for it, and then doesn't just break it, but actually tries to overturn it, I think that that is betrayal, and we should call it what it is. Boris was much criticised this week in the House of Commons. Well, let me tell you, the real surrender would not be the Hillary Benn Act stopping us leaving on the 31st of October with a clean break. The real surrender, the real sellout, would be to sign us up to a dreadful deal that would leave us trapped for year upon year, leave us paying the bills with no voice, no vote, no veto, no Mr Johnson. The real surrender would be putting through that dreadful withdrawal agreement. Don't reheat Mrs May's deal. That would be surrender. But isn't it extraordinary, isn't it hypocritical? No. But a group of people who for the last 10 years of my life have constantly abused me, threatened me, attacked me, called me all the names under the sun. Suddenly, when you call them out for what they've done, don't like it. As Corporal Jones would have said, they don't like it up them, do they? But I will say this, there's much talk about the temperature of political debate in this country. Much talk coming from the headmaster of the nation yesterday morning, John Burko. Did you see him? Do you know, he's almost the most unpopular political figure amongst leavers in this country. Almost. But I know, because this is the 10th evening we've done, pretty much on the spin, going around the country. And there are lots of names I could call out that you would boo. I mean, I could say Tony Blair. Or I could say John Major. But the one that gets the biggest boo is currently leader of a party who are hovering at around 0% in the opinion polls. 
she didn't have the decency to call a by-election when she defected and yet it would seem if you look at broadcast media and cable television she is on it seems for hour upon hour every day almost the new agony aunt of a nation yes the least popular figure with leave voters without a single shadow of a doubt is Anna Subri. <laughs> now, before I'm accused, which I no doubt will be, of using strong language and stirring up emotions, I want to make this very serious point. Civilized democracy only functions if you have the principle of losers consent. That matters in a democracy. <clears throat> and what has gone wrong? What has gone wrong since 26 is common? We've never seen before in this country. Normally, one side win, the other side, like, except how democracy works, the 2016 referendum. We've seen many senior figures who simply do not accept the result. They've done their best through parliamentary tricks and elsewhere to dilute, delay, frustrate, stop, reverse, or now even just revoke the greatest democratic exercise in the history of our nation. But it's worse than that. Because they've actually said that Brexiteers are basically stupid. That Brexiteers didn't know what they were voting for. That Brexiteers are somehow a lower subspecies than they are. They have a moral superiority. They believe they're actually better people than us. And that I think, that I think is where the strong language When I read that a cabinet minister has said that there'll be riots on the streets of this country if in a second referendum the Brexit result is overturned, I feel I must say something about it. The first thing is, if we did have to face a second referendum, and provided we were given a proper question with a genuine leave on the ballot paper, I have absolutely no doubt we would vote to leave by a bigger margin than we did back in 2016. But whatever happens, there will not, and listen to this establishment, please, there will not be violent riots on our streets. Do you know why? Because we have got a well-run, sensible, moderate, democratic political party called the Brexit Party. People won't riot, they'll come and join the Brexit Party and we'll do this democratically, we'll do it peacefully. Thank you. And I say that because this is now actually about more than just delivering Brexit. This is in fact about democracy itself. This is about our nation. This is about those who for hundreds of years built this nation, defended this nation, sacrificed so much so that we could be a nation. This is about who we are as a people and as a country. But it is also about our place in the world and our standing in the world. And I have to say, I've met so many people who've said to me, what on earth is happening to your country? We used to have great respect for the UK. We thought you were a great nation. We have been reduced by our politicians, not just to deliver Brexit, but I want us to reestablish where we should be in the world. Being represented, being represented in the higher councils across the globe, 
by somebody from the European Commission is, I would suggest, not worthy of who we are as a people. And of course, of course, and neighbours, but perhaps something we have forgotten in this country, which is important around the world and important to many communities that live here, is this. Those countries that make up the Commonwealth, and if you add in the United States of America as well, there are 2.7 billion people now living in those countries. They are our genuine friends and allies. trade to rediscover a world in which we have, through language and history, some quite extraordinary advantages. Now this is the tenth of our conference tour, but of course the Conservative Conference will begin this weekend. And I thought perhaps we might have just one or two quick words of advice for the Prime Minister. I was pleased that when Boris got elected, that he brought some much needed optimism and energy to the job. He needed it after what had gone before with Mrs May. And it was clear that the strategy and the tactic was let's out Brexit the Brexit party. Let's sound more Nigel Farage than he does. Because if we do this and if we say we'll die in a ditch or we'll do or die and we'll leave on the 31st of October, it's really simple, because what will happen is all those voters that supported the Brexit party will all come and support the Conservative party. That is what they thought. But here we are, and what they find is the Brexit party are rock solid in the opinion polls, and we're not going down. <laughs> And the reason for that is we just don't trust the party that tells us over and over what it will do, promises things in manifestos, actually I think often without the intention of ever delivering them. The reason Brexit partners are not going to go back, trust the party. It's simple as that. It's simple as that. But equally, Equally sure, likeable though Boris is in so many ways, we're not just sure what he himself actually believes in. Is he really, truly a genuine Brexit? I think quite disturbing. We saw a specimen of this in Strasbourg last week with the Parliament in session, and there we were, the 29 Brexit MEPs. They've sat us all together in a block. Big mistake. And every time, every time one of these characters attempted to talk down the country, say the referendum was a mistake, demand that we vote again, we rose to stand up and give voice to the fact that they really politely ought to just jolly well mind their own business. And you know, I think we've I think we've really had enough of being talked down to and humiliated by the bureaucrats of Brussels and many other European leaders, the last example of which was the pipsqueak in Luxembourg humiliating Boris Johnson. We've had enough of being talked down to. It's time we stood up for ourselves. But the worry, the worry was, the worry was, there were Juncker, and well, he's not all bad, I, I tell you. He's quite funny, actually. So we were talking about the backstop. Boris wants the backstop changed. And what worried me was Juncker saying in the Parliament that morning, I have no emotional attachment to the backstop. Hmm. I thought that worries me, because that's what Boris 
is asking for. And maybe he was still thinking of Boris, I don't know. When later on that day, after lunch, he, uh, he said he had no erotic attachment to the backstop. <laughs> but either way, either way, it looks like there are going to be some concessions from Brussels. And it looks like Boris Johnson has as his primary goal, indeed, as he's put in writing to the European Council, his highest priority is to get a deal. But it's not a new deal. It's an old deal. It's a reheated version of Mrs. May's fade deal. It failed three times in the House of Commons. It is a new European treaty. It is binding in international law. And any future trade deal that came from it would rely on them acting in good faith. I put it to you, that is not going to happen. And I'll tell you this, Mr. Johnson, Mr. Cummings, if you think, if you think, and if you do get this through, that you can sell this as Brexit, you're in for a big surprise. The British people won't swallow it. If they realize nothing has changed, they will not put up with it, and you will lose votes to us in absolutely huge numbers. Heed that warning, please. But of course, if he was to do the right thing, if he was to do the right thing and go in a general election, and by the way, there is a general election coming, don't worry. We are going to get our chance to get even with this parliament. But if he goes in a general election for a clean break Brexit, them far from fighting against him, we will work with him with a non-aggression pact because even though we're proud of the success we've achieved in the course of the last 25 weeks, to get this done, we would always, always, always put country before party to achieve the Brexit goal. Always. Thank you. Which is more, I think, than can be said for the Marxist rabble that recently got together in Brighton. The Labour Party promised in their manifesto that they would honour the referendum result on Brexit. They now, well, Emily Thornberry laid out the policy, didn't she? Brilliantly. Did you see her on question time the other week? Poor old Richard had to sit next to her for an hour. So this is how it's going to work, folks. According to Emily Thornberry, they're going to win the election. They're then going to negotiate a new deal in Brussels. They're then going to put that in a referendum to the British people, their deal against Remain, and then they're going to campaign against the deal they've negotiated in Brussels. You simply couldn't make it up, could you? You couldn't make it up. So there are five million, five million Labour voters out there who voted Brexit who now don't have a home. But it's got even worse than that, because the second betrayal by the Labour Party is they put in their last manifesto, when we leave the European Union, freedom of movement will end. And yet, they passed a motion that Mr Corbyn says he will abide by at their conference, not just to keep freedom of movement with the rest of Europe, but to extend it to most of the rest of the world. They have decided to embark upon a policy of uncontrolled mass immigration into Britain. And all of us in this party recognise that immigration can be a very good and a very positive thing for our nation, but you have to control it sensibly and selectively, and that is what people want and demand. And almost, almost unbelievably, they've said that all foreign citizens coming into the United Kingdom will also get the vote. 
They are trying to gerrymander the future of British politics through uncontrolled mass immigration. There will be no deals of any kind with Corbyn's Labour Party. And if you notice in those European elections, our strongest performances came in places like the northeast of England, in the valleys of South Wales. We are going to be the main challenger to the Labour Party in many traditional parts of this country. Seats they've held for 100 years, we will be the challenger. I think we've got energy and optimism in our party. I hope you're impressed with our technology, with our online, with our marketing, and I hope you think our men and women that have put themselves forward are a pretty good lot. I do. I do. So let's not make any mistake. Whenever this election comes, we are ready. Are you ready? Are you ready? We are ready! Thank you. We, we couldn't get everybody into this room. There's 300 people in a room at the back. So if you'd excuse me, Richard will take questions, but I think I better go and see those people. They've been waiting in a very hot little room for a long time. The first question is from Nigel from Chislehurst. What do we do with career politicians? Get rid of them. <laughs> As you know with Anne, it's no nonsense. The second question is a really important question. Apart from Brexit, what about reform? And we in the Brexit party, I think we all know that this country, given what we've seen this week, my word, this country needs serious political reform. And I talked earlier about, about investing, and actually we need to invest in political reform and direct democracy. We actually quite like referendum, don't we? But we, they must always be implemented the first time. So we believe we need to have a proper national debate about the House of Lords. Let's, it cannot be sustainable in its current form. It cannot be right that Tony Blair and David Cameron have appointed over six hundred unelected peers to the House of Lords. We need to reform it, we need to get rid of it and replace it with something else. We need to have a national conversation about our voting system, about the BBC. And the other important political reform is the scandal of postal voting. Because we, we saw what happened in Peterborough. 29% of votes in Peterborough were by postal votes. The average now across the whole country in any election is over 20%. Before Tony Blair changed the rules in the early 2000s, it was less than 2%. Postal voting needs fundamental reform. Martin... Martin from Northwood, he says, if we go to a general election, will we have the right people in the cabinet? And right people to make a cabinet. Will we have the right people? We shall have the best people. The best people. And, and any cabinet that was assembled from the Brexit party would be the best cabinet in our history. And then the final question is from Steve from London. What happens? Well, firstly, do we think Boris Johnson will get the withdrawal deal through the House of Commons? And then what can we, the Brexit party, do about it if he succeeds? And what are your thoughts? Um, it is just possible, just possible that he could get it through because an awful lot of them are scared silly for their seats and they're scared of a general election. 
and they think that if they vote this through, lo and behold, Brexit, and that nobody will notice that actually they haven't. So uh, it, it is just possible, but I wouldn't think it's a very high possibility. If he does get it through the House of Commons, then we have got to go into immediate action because uh, that deal would, as Richard said earlier and Nigel said earlier, tie us in to EU rules and laws for a very, very long time to come and in some cases forever. Uh, and the thing to note is that the political declaration which goes with the deal, which is given legal effect by the deal, actually says this that both sides must strive in the future to create a level playing field. In other words, we must be deals with any advantage. So we've got to fight it, and we've got to fight it very, very hard. But I'd much rather not worry about what in the first place. That's That's our job of work, ladies and gentlemen. That is the takeaway as we go from here. We've got to remind people this is literally the worst ever deal in history. Tell your friends, your family, friends of friends, we must not sign this terrible, terrible withdrawal agreement. Write to your MPs, encourage them. We shall be persuading Conservative MPs by various means to make sure that actually it comes to the house, if it comes to the house to persuade them of the benefits of a clean break Brexit and how much support we can give them in that situation. As Nigel says, we the Brexit party will always put country before party. And so, let's, make, let's have everybody on your feet. Let's make a huge noise to send to Westminster to remind everybody to remind those clowns, those parliamentarians. Are we ready, ladies and gentlemen? Yeah. Are we ready? Yeah. Are we ready? Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Have a great trip home and a very good weekend. I spent nearly a quarter of a century working and fighting for us to be an independent, self-governing, proud nation that makes its own way in the world, makes its own laws, controls its own borders. And I thought back in 2016, after that referendum, that we'd done it because I mistakenly, perhaps stupidly, believed what our politicians were telling us, believed what Prime Minister Theresa May was telling us. They told us, do you remember all of them told us that they would implement the result of the referendum? All of them told us in their manifestos that they would respect the result of the referendum and implement Brexit. And when I hear from a group of people some on the hard left, others just hard remain, who have, in the course of the last 10 to 15 years, particularly in this county, as I've campaigned, stood in elections, and when I've seen their abuse, when I've seen their trolling, when I've seen their intimidation, when I've seen their physical violence, now have the temerity to tell us that we shouldn't use words like surrender and betray. I suppose, in a way, I have to thank Ken Clark, the father of the House of Commons, who said today that this narrative of Boris Johnson's that the Brexit vote had been betrayed and that our interests were being surrendered to Brussels was a narrative
that was started by Nigel Farage, and of course... <laughs> the very... the very utterance of the name! <laughs> well, it gives them the heebie-jeebies! They're scared of me! But more important than that, they're scared of the Brexit party, and so they should be! One of the most remarkable things, having spent a couple of years outside of the frontline politics, living almost a normal life, but I decided I couldn't go on with it. I, 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 I couldn't witness this betrayal. I couldn't witness all that we'd fought for being given away. I couldn't witness the prize of being independent and free. What price freedom? That's what I thought of myself. Have I got to do something about this? It's got to do something. So I, I did perhaps the cleverest thing in my life and I founded the Brexit Party and Richard and I sat down and tried to build this organization from scratch. And we found wonderful people to stand for us and become MEPs and I'm very proud of them. And standing on this stage with me tonight, ladies and gentlemen, are the men and women who are our prospective parliamentary candidates in Kent and other parts of the South East. Yeah, I'm just fucking going there. And B. So. So I don't know. He's trying to piss me off. And be it. in no doubt. Be in no doubt that whatever comes, oh, we Smash are ready. Are you ready? Are you ready? Oh, we're ready. We're ready. But the most amazing thing that happened, having set up the Brexit party, with this remarkable rush of enthusiasm, energy, oh, and 25 pound people, registered supporters, signing up at 25 pounds a time. Of course, the media said the money had all come from Russia. <laughs> but I know where the money came from. I know how we raise millions. We raised it from you in this hall, from your 25 pounds, and I want to thank you to the bottom of my heart. I really do. So we got the thing set up, we got it moving, we launched on the 12th of April in a factory in Leicester, and then there we were. It was Easter Saturday, we were in the office, trying to work out the candidate list for the European elections. And I mean, literally, you know, the party was, had, had been born two weeks previously, and there we were planning to try to win a national campaign. Oh, by the way, unless you hadn't noticed, Alistair Campbell and the others will tell you that the Liberal Democrats somehow won the European elections. But the party, the party that didn't just win the European elections, but got 50% more votes than any other party in that contest, was the Brexit party, wasn't it? So there we were. Each Saturday, we've got printouts and goodness knows what all over the desks. We're trying to work out who to select, what to do. Not easy. And the phone rings. I pick it up. Hello? Uh, Nigel, I'm with it a bit. <laughs> Well, of course, I immediately stood to attention <laughs> and said, yes, ma'am, as you should do with royalty. It's very, very important. And she said to me, I couldn't believe it. You could have knocked me down with a feather. She said to me, are you looking for candidates in the European elections? I said, well, Anne, we're looking for good ones. <laughs> she said, I'm available and I want to stand. Thank you very much. Goodbye. <laughs> Uh, 
And I'm pleased because she's not here, because she's gone off to do news night. And I've got to tell you, the levels of energy, the levels of commitment, the levels of belief, the levels of a patriotic view that this is a great country, still full of great people, but bad Westminster by our career political class. She, she, I think, made a massive, massive difference. And I think with people like Anne Widdicombe, not only is she a great person, but there's also somebody else the European Commission hates, maybe even more than me. How about that? So she was the, she was the Maidstone MP from 1987, but extraordinarily, the previous Maidstone MP, who was there from 1950 to 1987, who died a couple of years ago in his 90s, Sir John Wells, who'd been a prominent pro-marketeer, a friend of Edward Heath's, and in my view, Sir John Wells, another former Maidstone member of Parliament. But unfortunately, with Helen Clark, and most of the other MPs that represent Kent, simply not the... We have been through two or three of the most extraordinary weeks I think we'll ever witness in British politics. But I suspect that this is going to get even worse before it gets better. One of the reasons is that John Burko is sitting as Speaker in the House of Commons. Oh, I've got better than that for you, don't you worry. And we've got whole rafts of MPs from all parties now breaking every single promise they've made, doing their best to try to overturn the Brexit result. We've got one MP who seems to now get warm to the